Thank you, David. Uh, that's some uh, neuroscience context. The next is uh, going to be a lot more technological information uh, and data. So we'll start with another video. Start your day with exercise. This increases concentration and contributes to your general well-being. Set up your work environment for maximum efficiency. No matter what you wake up to, try to stay in a positive mindset. Advising small businesses in this economic climate can be hard, emotionally. But it's your job to make the best of any situation. Tell me more about that. You become attached. It's normal. Isn't it? Of course. Things were so much simpler when people ran the corporations. But at some point the algorithms just became better at it. They started mutating, growing out of control, it's becoming impossible to compete. I tried to track them, but they're so complex. The truth is, no one really knows what's going on. How does that make you feel? Well, it's not useful to dwell on how bad things are. My clients need me, so I have to stay ahead. Managing your attention effectively is key. The aim is to achieve a laser focus and find ways to work around the limitations of the human body. There isn't always time to eat, but there are so many innovative ways to fuel your body and mind. We're made of chemistry. Our thoughts and emotions are triggered by hormones and blood oxygen levels. It's something to remember when things feel overwhelming. What about relationships? Friends? Family? Do you have a significant other? I... I just spend so much time working. You know? I mean, I know you have to keep putting yourself out there, but... You have to be clear about what you're looking for. Isolate the variables that are most important to you in a partner. Market yourself and use optimistic language in your profile. At the end of each day, take the time to reflect. If you collect enough data, you can start to see all sorts of patterns. Wasted time, dead ends. It makes me sick when I think about it. I don't mean to make you upset, but I have to check that you've thought this through. There's no way back. We can't rely on the corporations forever. They were built by people, but now they've got a life of their own. And they're all around us. So enormous, so powerful. And the only way for us to survive is to understand the network. I know that once I'm on the other side, I'll be able to be everywhere, see everything. I can give my clients a chance to fight back, to have total control. Are you ready to begin the procedure? Yes. Close your eyes and count backwards from 10. Perfect. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. Um, my name is Michal Gath Murad. I'm an architect and urban designer by training, uh, currently doing my PhD in cognitive science at the Chair of Cognitive Science uh, at ETH Zurich. A few words about um, the chair. We are uh, distributed between two uh, countries, two continents even. Sorry, I'm just going to adjust this. Um, and the first team lies in Zurich uh, at the Chair of Cognitive Science in ETH, and the second one um, 
is in a very special location in Singapore. It's called the ETH Future Cities Laboratory. And we work in close collaboration to explore how people occupy built environments. And we use computational tools um, and behavioral science methods uh, to model and simulate human behavior. And we are a very mixed team, psychologists, um, architects, computer scientists, and so forth. And the head of our, uh, of our lab is Professor Christoph Hulscher. He's a behavioral scientist. Um, and the talk, the title of my talk, going backwards uh, one slide or two, is Simulation of Cognitive Agents to Explore Occupants' Wayfinding Performance or Experience uh, in Future Buildings. And you're probably asking yourselves right now, what is wayfinding? I'll explain. What is cognitive agents? I'll explain that as well. And what is future buildings? I think you know, but maybe not from the architectural perspective. So I'll cover that as well. Now, I talk to, um, I'm an architect, but I talk about this topic with non-architects. And therefore, I always start with the architectural design process. And what you can see here behind me is a set of design goals. Uh, this is usually defined by the uh, stakeholders or by the architects themselves. And these are performance criteria set for a potential building. And it ranges from cost to energy consumption and to various aspects that relate to the human, such as patient safety, infection risk. I'm working a lot in hospitals. This is why my world um, is composed of infection spread. We'll talk about that. And then what architects are very good at is taking a brief, right, taking these performance criteria and in a very much a very interesting creative process that we know very little about, uh, but trying to learn more of, um, they generate solutions. And these solutions um, are futuristic, right? We, they are not yet built. And therefore, the question posed and underlies uh, my presentation is how do architects actually evaluate the generated solutions against those predefined goals? And how can simulation help them do it better. So the answer to the question, how do architects evaluate future buildings, um, the answer is not trivial because of a very, very trivial fact, right? Buildings are incredibly big, and we usually don't prototype them. We prototype parts of them, such as patient rooms or a specific apartment, but not the entire thing. Therefore, architects actually evaluate the representation of buildings, um, which has evolved tremendously over the years, all the way to what we know today as building information models. And building information models are actually digital representation, representations of buildings that encode uh, which objects are included in this future building, how are they, comp how are they um, synthesized together, uh, what is the form of the building, but also what is the semantic meaning of every object, and so forth. And from the building performance simulation perspective, building information models are a very reliable source of information to develop various models of how the building, the future building that does not yet exist, would interact with various um, physical aspects of the environment. And what you can see here behind me is, for instance, on the, on the right hand uh, bottom corner, you can see a wind flow simulation. And uh, on the middle part, you can see an earthquake simulation and glare and daylight and so forth. And architects have become increasingly good at predicting how the building would perform or would interact with the environment. But uh, when it comes to occupants, right, this small icon here on the right-hand side, building performance simulations are increasingly underdeveloped and building information models are basically useless from this perspective. And the outcome is this one. This is a classic nurse station in a classic hospital, generic hospital. And this is what architects actually see, an empty virtual 3D model of their building. Whereas reality functions more like this, right? We have occupants, occupants have behaviors, they have needs and so forth. And the ability to account for the gap between how architects envision or imagine, let's say, how the building would work from the occupant's perspective to how it actually works um, holds many, uh, the potential for many side and after effects, very much negative ones, from low operational efficiency to stress, disorientation, um, low productivity, and so forth. 
And throughout my research for the last five years, I'm Israeli originally, so I did my research in Israel at the beginning, and then I moved to ETH Zurich uh, to, um, to extend my knowledge in cognitive science. And I'm trying to um, bring building performance simulation, which is a wonderful way to predict how a building would perform, into this realm of occupant-centric performance simulations. And the various aspects of occupant-centric behavior that I'm relating to here are patient safety, infection spread, visual attention, visual exposure, but mostly uh, wayfinding. And the reason is that wayfinding is a very fundamental uh, human building interaction. This is something that you do every day across buildings. You have to find the entrance to this building, the exit to this building and so forth. This slide, for some reason, uh, would automatically transit, but never mind. So what is wayfinding? Wayfinding is information processing in space. And um, basically, there are two types of wayfinding. The one that you all think about when I say wayfinding, especially architects, which is aided wayfinding. It's the right-hand side. We use maps, we use Google Maps, we use uh, signage, and so forth to navigate. And this is what is called aided navigation. I don't care about this for this talk, although I have developed a virtual uh, simulation platform to predict how a smart city with dashboards would affect pedestrians' behavior. For this talk, I want to discuss how the architecture, right, how the space affects our wayfinding abilities. And this is what is called unaided wayfinding. Because once we as architects lay down the most basic lines of our plans, of our building plans, floor plans, we determine um, how people would wayfind. And when we ask this question, what influences wayfinding, then we have three main, main concepts. The first one is a cognitive map. How do people uh, establish representations of the building in their minds? Uh, we have strategies of individuals. Turns out that people who are unfamiliar with a setting would adhere to the most public and most integrated places or parts of the building to find their way. And of course, we have the building. And the building consists of various um, properties from the form. If I'm in the main hall, I can see long and far, meaning I have more information to process, and therefore I can make more informed decision, decisions. And uh, if I'm in a maze-like environment, my uh, lines of sight are shorter, therefore I have less information to make informed decisions. Functions, it has been discussed before, does it look like a duck or does it not, right? Does the building lend, it, lend itself to the function that it aims to serve? And of course, the use uh, in the Singapore team where we're working a lot on social density, how does crowds, uh, how do crowds affect wayfinding decisions? Do we follow the crowd or do we evade it? Um, and the underlying question for this presentation is actually how do we simulate wayfinding by architecture, wayfinding by space, to inform preliminary stages in architectural design. And this goes more to the scientific aspects of what is simulation. Simulation is not new by no means. It has been done by others in physics and in social science. And it is quite a well-established field. And it always starts with a target. In our case, we want to simulate wayfinding. So we have to observe wayfinding in reality, right? This is our target system. We then perform some sort of abstraction. We do data analysis. Um, and rule-based modeling and decision tree modeling, which I'll, sh I'll soon show you, and then we reach a model. And then we have two parallel threads. The first one goes to simulation. We, sim we use the model that we've developed to simulate some sort of phenomena, in this case, wayfinding, and we also analyze the collected data, and eventually we do the most important step in simulation, which is validation. We compare the collected data against the simulated da data and try to establish something that is called the goodness of fit. Okay, what is the predictive power of our model? And in our lab, we use uh, a plethora of methods to observe that target system, wayfinding, right? So we do uh, wayfinding experiments in the real world using eye tracking, for instance, to try to understand how does visual attention correlate with specific wayfinding behaviors. Uh, we go to the virtual environment, right? And we do the same, um, yeah, this video that you can see here. Um, we basically put people in a virtual environment of a building that does not exist yet, and then we try to understand, okay, so how does wayfinding adapt or change according to the um, design of the building? 
We also do spatial analysis, which is quite interesting because it enables us to quantify the difference in terms of um, different configurations. What you can see here is basically um, isovist analysis. We basically shoot rays from each cell and we try to quantify the properties of each cell in terms of the view shed polygon. Not gonna go too much in depth. If you're interested, ask me later. Um, and then we observe Right? We observe the real world, and then we reach the model. This is my own model as part of my PhD. Uh, I call it Cold Arc, and you can see on the left-hand side there are three main groups of objects. The first one is agents, the second one is environments or spaces, and the third one is tasks. And what I try to do is I try to take the data that I took from the real world or that I observed in the real world, and I try to model each of these components. And here comes the part that might interest you, or I think that there's other parts as well, but let's focus on this one. I take the data and I try to model cognitive agents. Now, my definition of cognitive agents differ slightly from the one that is classically used in computer science, uh, where you get recommendations, right, from Netflix on which movie um, you should see next based on your preferences, but rather I want agents to make mistakes. They are situated, I want them to be bounded in terms of their knowledge, they're not getting complete knowledge of the environment, um, they have a limited attention span, and they have emotions. It means that once an agent becomes disoriented, it has a parameter of stress, and that stress leads to various types of decisions that would not have been incurred otherwise. Now, um, and who plays video games? Just by a show of hands. Okay, nice. Um, so if you've ever played video games, you probably know um, Unity 3D. This is where the majority of video games in the last 10 years have been uh, developed. And uh, it's extremely realistic. Uh, it provides a very um, immersed sensation once you see this video, especially even in 3D. Um, but I'm not gonna go into that. But from the scientific perspective, the reason that game engines are a very prolific uh, development environment for simulation, and this is le leading me to, okay, so we have data and we have cognitive agents, we wanna model this complex system, how do we do it? How do we account for the complexity in terms of the interactions between agents um, and environments? And this is why we use Unity. So Unity, uh, one of the major uh, features that it has, it has, and like every other game engine, by the way, it's not specifically Unity that I'm selling, I'm not working for them. Um, and they basically imbued a physics engine into their um, development environment. It means that we are able to detect collisions between objects in the world. We are able to understand what an agent sees, where an agent is, all the time, and we can account for the complex geometries like this building, this beautiful building that we are in, um, and introduce an agent into it, right? So this is why we use game engines. Now, wait. Okay, and this is an interesting slide because what you can see here is that uh, the development environment that I'm talking about, Unity, has become uh, very useful to simulate various, sorry, the videos are supposed to work. Okay, here, various uh, types of, um, of, of scientific explorations from crowd simulations to um, cognitive agents to autonomous vehicles, uh, CFD, and so forth. These are some of my own works uh, as well. And when we go to Unity, or when we go, we approach um, the, uh, implementat the implementation stage or the modeling stage, we start off by taking the building information model that I talked about before, right, the one on the left-hand side, and we start to process the geometry to be able to establish the navigation space. There's a series of pre-processing steps, uh, starting from automatic object classification, trying to understand what is what, uh, and then we build a navigation grid uh, that I'm not gonna go into the process, but if you're interested, please let me know, I'll explain more, to eventually create a navigation space for the agent to um, read while navigating. Um, we also do a series of spatial analysis to further mediate spatial properties of the space. 
We move on to model occupants. Uh, because we're working, uh, especially in hospitals, where we try to simulate future hospitals, uh, we need to communicate our simulations with stakeholders uh, that are not necessarily architects or computer scientists. So the representation, the realistic representation is really important. People are able to understand what they're seeing and make uh, informed assumptions. Now let's go to the behavior. Um, so given that we're working in Unity, we have a rich AI library, um, we can simulate, for instance, an agent on the left-hand side has a field of view, has a decision tree, and we, of course, feed that decision tree with very basic information received both from the uh, empirical studies and from literature. So you can see here strategies for wayfinding and uh, local heuristic for wayfinding. You can probably, if you know anything about um, search algorithms, probably some of you can, um, can relate. And then we move on to simulation. Uh, simulation, visualization, and analysis, because these are the things that we look at to quantify wayfinding performance across buildings. We look at completion time, distance covered, um, and so forth. And we also try to understand um, the deviation from the shortest path. Let's say that you need to navigate from here to the emergency exit. Uh, there is a shortest path that we can calculate, but how would a typical user do it, right? What is the difference in terms of their distance and the one covered by a shortest path agent? And then, of course, comes the final stage of validation. Validation is crucial. As I told you before, if we don't validate our models, we basically um, are doing video games, and we want to take it into the scientific realm. So what you can see here is uh, a very bad attempt, which is very important to show of a validation step. You can see on the right-hand side trajectories from real participants performing wayfinding, right, in uh, Zurich Hauptbahnhof, uh, the main station in Zurich. And on the left-hand side, um, an agent um, or 1,000 runs of, um, of very, very, very basic agents uh, developed by, by one of my students. And you can see that there isn't a good fit, right? But this actually leads us to the next step where we reiterate and reiterate. And I've talked about wayfinding, but I also want to talk about uh, these two, operational efficiency and activity choice, because these are really important uh, in hospitals. And it's really, um, it can also be done as part of this overall framework of occupant-centric performance simulations. So um, this is work done as part of my research uh, in um, Next Gen BIM uh, research group at the Technion Israel. Um, it's a collaborative group project. We started off with data collection. Uh, we basically shadowed nurses and doctors in hospitals. If you know, uh, the privacy rules are quite stiff, so we could not put sensors. We had to really shadow people. Um, we produced quite a lot of data. Uh, observations lasted for over a month. And uh, eventually we did a very basic behavior mapping to understand actually what goes on in the ward throughout the day. Uh, the attempt here was to create a schedule of building activities or of occupants activities in this uh, hospital and uh, analyze it. We also used experts to further generalize our schedules and here come the occupants which we model. We also model their activities. We also integrate some semantics into the building. And eventually, we use uh, the model that we've created to compare two different design scenarios. On the left-hand side, you can see a floor plan. Wait, there's no, okay, yeah. So you can see the, the two floor plans are identical. Here we have something called a day room. It's a social space within the ward. And here you can see that the same space is blocked. Um, what we actually did, we took our model, we ran several simulations, and we also delved very deep into uh, visualization and data analysis to be able to see, okay, so we know it's a very trivial case, right? We can assess it before just based on our experience, but we wanted to see if the simulation model that we have is sensitive enough to reveal the differences. And these are trajectories, as you can see. This is density mapping, which basically you can see that there's of course more density in the area of the, um, of the uh, day room and the corridor that is adjacent to it. Um, 
We also did something very cool, I think. We put um, a sound uh, model on the occupants where we tried to understand, okay, so given the distribution of activities, how does sound propagate in the building? And does it propagate differently when we have a day room versus when we don't have one? And actually, it turns out that if we aggregate, this is what we, this is what we get. We basically get that the patient rooms that are in front of the day room are much more noisy throughout the day, whereas in this case, the noise tends to go to these directions. And uh, the last thing that I'm gonna show is about uh, the medical errors done by nurses as a result of uh, interruptions from visitors, which is quite crucial and has quite um, uh, far-reaching effects, um, which we also try to look at. Of course, that uh, in this case, validation uh, is still not existing. Hopefully it will uh, in the next few months. And then we can see if the model actually compares to something that we can look at at the lab as well. Um, finally, wait, there's one more slide before this one. Uh, it's actually quite advanced because I wasn't sure about the, the crowd that we're gonna have today. Um, just a few notes, wait. There was one more slide, yeah, this one. Sorry. It doesn't wanna play. Okay, so this is just to trigger you. Uh, these are a bunch of other simulations that I've developed. There's also a smart city simulation. This is what you can see on the top. On the left-hand side, there's also a smart hospital here on the right-hand side um, and if you were interested, let me know. And uh, just a few words about the future work. Um, we can't only look at humans. We can't only look at occupants. Uh, we need to look at the whole, right? Those energy simulations, daylight and so forth, have to come into play. So I, um, my, my, my mission is to develop an integrated building performance simulation. Um, but until then, uh, there are two other points that are, I think, incre increasingly becoming relevant. Anyone heard about WeWork? WeWork? Okay, so WeWork has uh, a very nice algorithm right now, and they're trying to replace architects. And this is not new, this has been an attempt for the last, I think, 20 to 30 years. But technology is at the right point right now. So we can definitely approach this process. Now, we do it through this process called generative design or evolutionary algorithms. And in this case, what I argue is that we need to also score those solutions, right, from the occupant-centric perspective. We need to simulate wayfinding across the solution space and rank the solutions um, from the human perspective as well. Otherwise, we will get environments that are optimized for cost, for energy, but not for humans. And eventually, form follows experience. I don't know, I hope so. Thank you. Um, this is, thank you. I just wanna say something for the students here. Um, so, yeah, my email was there. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, I am very much looking forward to um, master students, um, perhaps interested in internships at our chair, either in Zurich or in Singapore. So if you're interested, let me know. Thank you.